I am a total wacko when it comes to shopping. I mean, I know it. I admit it. I'm a sick man. I will not ask for help from a clerk. Not, not going to do it. I mean, like practically, practically never. I mean, if I'm at Home Depot, for example, and, and if I really need help, I might just kind of walk around for a little while and just sort of hope that I run into my friend, the store manager, Tony Mazzola. And, and you know, so understand, you know, here at Tri-State, we're a Home Depot church. We're not a Lowe's church. This is a Home Depot church because of, of Tony, you know. So, I, I, but I won't ask for help, and I'll walk around, and, and maybe I'll see him if it's really, really, I mean, like really, really bad. And, and, and you know, I'm... I'm not likely to seek him out either unless it's just awful. And I'm trying to think, oh, why am I like this? I'm not sure what it is. I try to understand this psychosis that I have. And, and I should probably seek counsel from uh, Tim Lester, but, well, he's a man. He's probably just as bad as me, so probably it's Linda Ellis I need to actually, actually see on this. But I think a part of it for sure, I know this for sure, is I really don't want to bother somebody with my, my question. And the clerks, they always look so busy. And, you know, sometimes when I'm walking around, they'll actually, I probably see the, the confusion in me, and they'll come up and say, can I, can I help you? Now, you'd think that would make it all okay, and it, but, but no, it's still not okay. I, I still, I'll say, no, I, I'll know what I'm looking for when, when I see it. I won't even let them let them help me. And they always look so busy and everything. So, yeah, I mean, I realize that's really stupid, isn't it? Because they're paid to be there to do the very thing that I need to help me in this time of, of need when I have a, have a question. Uh, but not wanting to, to be a pest, I guess I have to, in further self-diagnosis, kind of admit that, well, I don't I guess I'm just too proud to ask for help and admit that I don't know something. I want to try to figure it out for myself. It's this, you know, real men don't ask directions kind of thing that goes on, you know. So, yeah, that's kind of stupid too. But, you know, that's kind of how, how we are when it comes to communication with God. We have this great resource to help us in the Bible in the scriptures that God has given us, wherein we can hear from God. And then we have this other great resource that goes along with it. Going back the other ways, we, we can pray to God and bring our needs to him in, in our time of need. And, and he asks us to do this. But so often, as God's people, we're like me wandering around Home Depot. We don't do that. We don't access the resources that are ours. It's trying to like kind of like trying to figure out how to do this building project of life without doing much research and without seeking any help. And, and unless it's just really just so bad that, that the, the store manager of life happens to be kind of, you hope, wandering around and miraculously it sort of helps you out and volunteers to kind of fix it for us. Well... Yeah, you, you, you heard that right. I kind of I kind of compared God to Tony Mazzola in the opening <laughs> illustration today. So let's see if Carol Mazzola will, will shout amen to that one. <laughs> we have great resources in the scriptures. In the first week of this teaching series that we've begun here in this new year, last Sunday, um, we're talking about momentum, overcoming the myths to making radical disciples. And this series, as Chris began last week, and this is the second of six, is, is being done in tandem again with what is happening at 11 o'clock. The church is a family of disciples, we say in the brochure that we give you, that make disciples. And God's designed the church to have momentum, to be a body in motion, to live out in Jesus' mission here on earth. But what is a disciple and how is it that we make disciples? So you see, 
we want you to be moving on, to be moving forward continuously from being a disciple who's learning about following Christ to gaining some success in that, to being able to be not just a disciple who's following. Yes, you want to keep doing and keep following Christ, but you want to also then be a discipler who can reach out and bring others along and really reach out beyond the walls and share the gospel of Christ with others that they may begin to follow and walk along as well. To be a disciple, it says in our, in our, our, our preview of this series, to be a disciple is to be a follower of Jesus. You may struggle to know just what this means. We've come to accept a series of myths about Christianity, that Christianity has a positive influence in a person's life, but being a disciple that makes disciples, wow, that's really only for the spiritual giants and the professionals, the people who are kind of paid to do this, the people who have really, really, really gone a long time. The rest of us, are all, we're, we're all just followers back here, and that's not the way it's to be. In the Christian life, you're to follow, yes, but again, as you follow, you want to be one who really knows the Lord and walks along. So this week, too, in this series, I really want to understand how all of this fits and flows together. Chris began last week by talking about what does it mean to really know Christ, really know Christ, knowing in the sense of having a security of certain relationship with him. And so, do you know Christ, really? That's what we talked about last week. And then this week, are you using the resources that are yours in Christ, of the scriptures, of prayer? And so that's for today. Next week, Chris comes back and talks about, are you growing? Are you really growing and moving along further in, in faith? And then finally, the last three weeks, the second half of the series, as well as with the T35 class at 11 o'clock, are you able to explain the gospel to others, to lead into how to do that over a three-week period? And, and Tim and I will be sharing over those three weeks with you here at 9.30. So it kind of looks like this, if you take a, the flow of it. It goes from knowing, knowing Christ to a, a, a flow. With Christ, Do you have a flow of relationship, of his word to you, of prayer back to him? Of so from growing to flowing, or from knowing to grow, flowing to growing, are you really moving along and following in Christ to showing, to being able to show that to other people? So that is the process that we want to be moving along, and if you're doing that, you have a momentum that is pushing and moving you forward. So the question today is to ask if you are actively in the flow of the Christian life by using the resources that are yours in God's word and in prayerful communication with him. It doesn't make any sense to be a Christian without being active in this way in the scriptures and in prayer. To do that would be kind of like a, a fan of a team and not knowing what's going on with That you never go and see the games. You you never are never there. You never listen to them on the radio or or watch those games on on TV or in streaming video. You don't follow anything what's going on with the team online through varied websites or through the newspaper or whatever. But but boy, you're you're a fan of the team. Boy, that's that's your team. But you say you're a big fan. That, That doesn't make any sense. And so it doesn't make any sense as well to be a believer in Christ and say, yes, he's my Savior, he's my Lord, and to not have as a regular flow of your life his word into your life, of a regular communication and relationship with him. There are so many verses in the passages in the Bible, particularly in the New Testament, that we could go to to emphasize this central truth of the necessity of God's word in your life and of communication in prayer. From the preview, you follow our resources online that go with our sermon series. This particular series, we have sort of a preview on Friday and then kind of a wrap-up uh, tomorrow on Monday following each of the services. But the preview from Friday, if you read that, I made reference there to that great passage in John 15 about abiding in Christ. The whole idea of being connected to the vine. The vine and the branches. He is the vine and we are the branches. And as we stay in him it says that we can bear much fruit. But it goes on to say, because without me, you can do nothing, Christ says. You can do nothing without that connection. And as the title of that devotional on Friday said, what part of nothing don't you understand? How much can you do? Nothing. 
without abiding in Christ. 2 Timothy 2.15, we have that famous passage that says, do your best to present yourself to God as one who is approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Paul writing to Timothy. Now, you may say, now, hold on here a minute, Randy. Now, I've read that. I've read that chapter. And I've read that passage. And that passage is talking to you. That's who it's really talking to. Well, I get that. I get that. And that's true for those of us who, in a more vocational day-in and day-out ministry way, are those who handle the scriptures. It does first speak to us. But it speaks to all of us to be people who grow in the knowledge of Christ. It says in Peter about growing in Christ. Um, that we may know him more and serve him better. Um, now, I, I also, in, in the devotional I shared with you on Friday, I made reference to a, to a, a friend of mine. You know, I'm, I'm involved with historical things and Antietam and all of that. And one of my pals down there, probably some of you had in high school if you went to South High, uh, John Michael Priest, who wrote a book on Antietam called Antietam the Soldier's Battle. And he said that the Civil War was the first conflict in history that was fought by armies that contained large numbers who could read and write. The literate common soldier in the battle. Because before that time, most battles in history and all that happened was through the eyes of the literate, probably leaders and generals and, and those at the top, while the illiterate folks formed the common armies of the time. And so the Civil War is this incredible resource of people who were first-hand eyewitness guys, not just the ones behind a wall watching the folks charge over the hill, but those who charged over the hill themselves and were able to write about it and give us an incredible resource for it. And prior to this time, the masses of the people were, again, often illiterate and in their churches and in their faith communities. They were dependent upon the educated clergy to read, to study, to share the truths of Scripture with them. They would then gain an oral tradition that they would share with others. But many of them didn't have that resource to be able to, in a firsthand way, read the scriptures and grow and learn from them, like all of you are able to do, and we are able to do in our era so pervasively. If you travel ever, in, in, as I have a bit, in Europe, or uh, even more than that, in like East Asia, in places where Christianity was early established, in places that have a history that go back a whole lot further than our own does here, you see in the great cathedrals of Europe, and even in the small abbeys of very little towns, in, if you go to like a place like Cappadocia in eastern in Turkey, where early Christians burrowed out a life into the ground, with, into caves and underground places where they met. You see all over the walls of all of these places artwork that depicts varied scenes. And for many people, that was the scriptures that they had. That is all that they knew often as they would hear the oral tradition, being unable to read it themselves, but they would hear of it and the scenes would depict it and they were like teaching tools that went along with the spoken word, all to say what an incredible resource we have in the time in which, we, in which we live. We have so many resources that there's really no excuse to not know and learn and flow, as we're saying, to flow in the scriptures with the educational tools that we have to help us have a connection with God. But honestly, the biblical exhortation to know God's truth and to live and obey it dates back to the earliest days of Scripture, long before even the New Testament passages that we've referenced. It goes back to the earliest author of Scripture, back to God's word through Moses. And so today, we turn to the central and most basic passage in the Old Testament, to the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6, a passage that is a summary set of verses in the Old Testament, very much in a similar fashion as John 3 is kind of the, the, the heart of, of the kernel of, of it all in the New Testament, especially John 3.16, as we all know that verse and quote it, that it summarizes the gospel message of what Christ, who he is, and what he came to do, the love of God for us and for the world that he would give his son. And so that basic passage is the one we're looking at for the Old Testament saint, for the Jewish saint. And so we read here this basic idea in the passage today, that God's law was meant to be in front 
of them at all times. It was to be a part of regular family life, day in and day out, shaping every aspect and defining and informing every moment of their lives. So while I want you to understand today that we are at the center of the heart of the big idea uh, of, of all ideas in terms of practical truth about how to live Yet I want you also to understand that it boils down to some very simple concepts that when followed brings us success in the flow of life. So look with me in Deuteronomy in chapter 6. Deuteronomy 6, the first um, three verses say this. Moses writing to the children of Israel, speaking of the God's covenant law, he said, These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. I believe as we look through this passage, we can see four simple truths that to me kind of jump out at us as pretty simple truths. It's not complicated. It's not difficult. It's pretty basic, but you've got to commit to them. Here's the first of those simple truths is that to say, you've got what you need in God's word. I think a lot of people walk around feeling like there's something missing. There's just something that they haven't discovered yet about the Christian life, and I'm not sure what it is. No, you have what you need in God's word. It's not that complicated. If you'll be faithful to read them and faithful regularly to commune with God in prayer over the scriptures and through them, over time you learn a pattern of life, of hearing from God and the impressions that he gives you through his word. I will tell you, I've had five things, as I look back, are five distinct moments in life that were clearly God moments, where God intervened in a really special way through a variety of circumstances, often surprising me, but clearly that just couldn't, it was one of those, that couldn't have just happened. That, that was God showing up. That was God making something known to me to either push me boldly in a direction or to pull me back from jumping off an edge I was not to go over. And uh, I would venture to even say that a few of these things were almost borderline on the miraculous. But to tell you the truth, all of the rest of life, so if there's five of them, they show up like about once a decade or so. (laughs) You know, but the rest of life, what I've had to do is what we all have to do. We have to trust God in the quiet moments of life, in quiet ways of hearing his voice. Yes, and watch the circumstances of life around us, being active in the scriptures, active in prayer, and seeing as things move and as God opens and closes doors and the impressions that we have from God's word and in prayer, we know and learn his direction and his voice and his ways. I told you a story not too long ago, of, uh, and I'll repeat it again because I think it bears uh, illustrative purpose here. There was a time a couple, three years ago where I was extremely discouraged. Um, I, was, I, w- I felt beaten down. I was ready to quit. I considered just, just quitting it all, really. And uh, I, I said, man, I really need to hear from the Lord. And I went back, and you've heard me tell this story before, I know. I'm not getting old. I do remember saying, yeah, I am getting old. But I do, re- <laughs> I do remember telling you this before. I went back to the church, to the place, to the room, to the very spot where I first met the Lord, like Jacob did in going back to Bethel. I went back to that spot, and I sat there, and I spent an afternoon praying, reading. I read from the beginning of Acts through the end of Jude. I read the whole thing, and praying and saying, God, where am I at? Where are we at? What do you want me to do? And what I can tell you is that an impression that jumped out of the scriptures at at me in a way that I had never seen it over and over and over again through this is that what I was feeling, that what I was experiencing, and that what I was moaning about was not that unusual, 
that all those who tried to work and live and, and serve Christ over the years, that all had the same kinds of experiences. I, I wasn't in some weird, unique, special place. And uh, that's what I, I got from it. Basically, God saying, you know, Randy, nice to talk with you here, but, you know, stop whining, stop feeling sorry for yourself, and, and, and go back to work. Simple truth. Simple truth, number two, coming out of this passage, is that God's desire is for you to succeed. It's his desire is for you to succeed, to be successful in life. For some people, uh, 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 for some reason, a lot of people don't buy this notion as really true. And of course, I'm not talking here about a health and wealth gospel that you succeed and, and you drive fancy cars and, and, you, and you wear, you know, you know fancy clothes and jewelry, whatever. It, I'm not, not talking about that kind of thing at all. I'm talking about a life that's successful, a life that's satisfying, a life that brings contentment, a life where you see that you have a purpose that God has called you to, and you're living out that purpose in, in, in your time. And, um, and he says, as a passage here, that you may enjoy a long life. Now, he doesn't say endless life. He says a long life. You know, endless life is for another time and for eternity. And, you know, we are all still, though, in this world subject to the curse of death and to futility in a fallen and a sinless world. But even in that world and even in this world with its sinful injustices, we can find a life where we live out our days in fruitful work for the Savior who has given his life for us if we will be people who obey him. And so there are some simple formulas for success or for failure. I'll give you a couple of formulas right here. If you have a remembrance of God and you exhibit a dependent trust upon him, and you add to that obedience in the things that you do according to his word, you find success in life. But it's simply, as, it's, it's just as much a true equation that if you forget God, if you express an independence from him, if you don't honor what he has to say in terms of that which is right and wrong and obedience with him, it does tend toward a life that is defined rather by failure let alone to our own devices and to natural drift in our lives. We will tend to forget. We will tend to devalue the work of God in the past if we're not people of his book and of communication with him. And that is the problem that Israel had. And it is a problem that is endemic to all generations. And it becomes the role of folks who have walked further with the Lord and be the younger or older folks to look back to those behind and to remind them of these truths and of these principles and these formula that work. Continuing on in our passage, it says in verse 4 and following, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments I give you when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. You know, Here's a simple truth, number three. God is not too complicated to love and obey fully. God is not too complicated to love and obey fully. Verse four is the John 3.16 passage of the Old Testament, the equivalent of it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You say, that's, a big, that's, a, that's really the big verse of the Old Testament. I mean, that's the one called the great Shema, which is the word for hear in, in, in Hebrew. And, and it's a call to hearing. It's a call to see their God as the one true God. Here's kind of what it's like. In, in, in Israel, the thing that made Israel distinct and the worship of the one true God distinct from the other nations around is that the other nations of the ancient pagan world, the various tribal ethnic groups who had long since previously truly known God, but they had all walked away from God and rejected him. They'd become animistic. They'd become polytheistic. It was really difficult in those kinds of places with a, with a polytheistic system of multiple gods that had to be appeased and worshipped, who 
often were in their systems at war and battling and, and angry with each other, and you had to try to keep them happy. It was really, really kind of complicated to please these varied gods. Maybe you feel that way working with the government sometimes, you know. If you obey this, you bother that. It reminded of the time when Nathan and, and I and some of the family were working to build that business that's in downtown Hagerstown, bringing back a store from, from talk about antiquity, in, a, in, a, in an old building, and there was a spot where there was a doorway that went outside and there was an exit sign, you know, like you have exit signs. It was exit, but it didn't really take you to safety. All it did was take you out of that immediate place into this little alley that was closed off from being able to get outside truly to safety. So an inspector came in and said, you need to cover that sign because it doesn't go out to safety. Well, that made sense, so he covered the sign. Next inspector comes in, you know what happens? Finds us for having an exit sign covered, okay? You know, that's what it was like in the old world, dealing with, with polytheistic systems of gods who, who, were, who were like at war with each other and so on. In Israel, you had the one true God. And this true God had given them now, through the law, his ways and his truth. It's not complicated. It's not hard. Do it, and you will find a formula for success. And then a fourth simple truth that comes out of this is God's truth is to be part of every moment of life, to be a part of every moment of life. It's not a compartmentalized thing. Our faith is not something that we deal with just when we come in here for an hour or two on Sunday or when we hang out in our small groups, but it's something that goes with us through all of life, and it needs to be pervasive, and for it to be pervasive in all of our lives, day in and day out. We need to have a plan to prioritize it, that it will be pervasive in all of life. And especially the challenge for God's people is to do this with children, to do this with the growing, younger families that we have around us. And you have to talk about God in life and all the things that go on around you that you may pass on this truth and that children may see God in the everyday of life and that it becomes a pervasive part of their lives. Boys, come on up here. I got, uh, um, now that I, you know, I, I just turned a, a big round ugly number this month, and, um, you know, and looking back, I, I feel like I can, uh, I, I can see that God has, has blessed in our family, and my two youngest boys aren't, aren't here. They're away at work and college and things like that, but the older three are here. And Diane and I tried in our family to make this passage a reality in working hard to talk about God, to talk about Christ, to talk about the scriptures, and to have it as sort of a pervasive part of life. So I got my three older guys here. So I don't know. Aaron, you've, you handed you the mic. You're closest. Where did you see it in our home growing up? I mean, the aside from plenty of discipline and yes. plenty of spankings. You're saying, aside from that, where do we Aside learn? from that. Okay. We're being positive here. Okay? Right, right. Deservedly so, I mean. And, and your mom has control of the microphones upstairs, too, so. Hey, mom, look, I'm on stage. Um, no, I think it was, it's, like, it's like you're saying in point number four, that it's kind of it's pervasive part of life. It wasn't something, um, it, it wasn't something that, was, that was weird or, or a different part of life. It was, it, whether it was... Uh, and mom was creative. Mom was always like, she, you know, she'd buy, buy you like Bible board games or something and like trick you, trick you into learning about the Bible. By, and they're like, well, this is a pretty cool board game. I'll play this. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, to get you hooked on Adventures in Odyssey. Any, any Adventures in Odyssey people in here? I have every single, every single episode. Okay. We have every single one. And it was a, a fight over who's going to listen to them first at Christmas time. Other kids are like at G.I. Joe's and we got Adventures in Odyssey, but we loved it. So um, I don't know. It's just it, it, it's just in the little in the little things that it was um, that that especially mom. I mean, dad did some stuff too, but mom's at home with us, you know. So uh, mom's at home with us. So that's where we, that's where we get that mostly. But mom always brought it back to. I mean, even and I don't think you realize this as much until you get older. But she always brought back discipline and things like that to to where God is. It wasn't just you're being bad and you're driving me nuts. I mean, sometimes there's that, but generally it's you're being bad and here's why you're being bad and here's a scriptural reason why you're being bad. This is not what God wants in your life. Am I right? She always say that. So, 
uh, and then I guess dad, uh, dad did some stuff too, but dad was at work. So, but, <laughs> but the one thing that, that dad always, that, that uh, I can remember as a child is dad and my grandmother used to live in New Jersey back where we were from, and that was three hours away. And dad used to go there about once a month to, uh, to go take care of things for her. And, and it was like the coveted thing to go with dad on that because you're homeschooled, so you can leave. You can go for an entire two days with dad to go to your grandmother's house and get spoiled by two people. So it was the coveted trip. I mean, you're hoping your brothers all come down with like some awful sickness so that you're the only healthy one capable of going. So I mean, everybody wanted to go. But I can remember on those trips that uh, it was always a good time to talk with dad. I mean, and it was, it was a, I don't know, you talk about a variety of things, but that's a lot of where I learned, where I learned stuff from dad because it's the only time you get just to be just with dad. Um, so those are kind of my memories. Am I supposed to pass this? Yeah, yeah, pass it to Nathan. And Nathan, tell us, uh, tell us about the Egyptians, okay? Yeah, for me it was more a, everything we did involved some type of biblical lesson, some kind of story, whether it was um, audio books and tapes, songs, music. We would, we would sing, kazoo ourselves to sleep, singing uh, different worship songs and Bible songs. Salty in the songbook. That was uh, we we did musical church programs. There was really very little delineation between when we were at church doing Jesus things and when we were at home doing Jesus things. I don't think we realized that at the time, but uh, it, it, I've learned that with my own kids, it's, it's very difficult to always bring those things up and break it apart from uh, everything secular going on. Well, the famous uh, Egyptian story was Nathan listening to a Bible story at night. And, um, and he was supposed to be in bed, and after a while, you hear him talk, he said, hey, Dad, back in Bible times, people had arms, right? I said, yeah. Why do you ask that? He said, because in the Bible story tape, it says the, Egyptian, or the Israelites are running from the Egyptians, and they say, how shall we fight them? For we have no arms. Okay. <laughs> so it was a learning time. All right, Ben. Uh, yeah, i definitely highlight on, on kind of what Nathan and both, Aaron, both Nathan and Aaron said with... Uh, just growing up as a, in a homeschool family with, with our brothers and our, our dad being a pastor, there was, I mean, it was full-time, uh, I, I guess, a, a Christian childhood from, I mean, church was not too much different from home. And we didn't get, I mean, outside of some homeschool groups with, with Christian families, we, uh, we really had kind of an isolated uh, uh, childhood. But we turned out pretty good, I would have to yeah. say. I should have previewed uh, this a little more, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, but I would definitely highlight on, on, on a lot of my memories in, in my childhood, personally, would be with, with musical things and, and dance things, and, and that even extends to you know, here with Second Hour, with what I'm going to be doing with the kids, and um, always, always getting up there and expressing some of my talents in that, in that fashion. All right. Thank you, guys. Put that down, guys. Okay. Yeah, Ben, uh, ben loved the kids' programs at church. I remember when... Uh, when we told them, because they were very involved in the kids' programs at, at, and, um, at our previous church, they said, we're moving to, moving to Maryland. It's going to be it's just this really cool church. They have a worship team, you know. And I was describing what it was like, and Ben was terrified at the thought of, I mean, he's like, what, were you about eight years old, I guess, or something? And uh, terrified at the thought of going to this new church. And he says, what? What? This church? They don't have pews? And they don't have hymn books? Why don't you think they're Christians? <laughs> So, anyhow, uh, church was a very, very, very big part of life, for sure. But the pervasive aspect of it, and for it to be pervasive, it has to be intentional, whether it's with your family or whether it's in your own personal life. You have to plan for it. I know some of the reason we don't get to doing Scripture reading as we ought is just the whole sense of the busyness of life, the time schedule and all of that. Simply a problem that people don't read as much as they used to. And I'll even let you in on an insider thing at church. Do you know why we tend to take a lot of time on announcements and letting you know what happened, what's happening? Because we don't believe you're really going to read it somewhere else, even though we put it out there, okay? People just don't read like they, like they used to, and that becomes a problem. But we have such a great resource, and we've got to make it a thing that we do. It needs to become 
a big part of our life. A wonderful article came out just this week in Christianity Today. Of course, January issue, kind of talking about resolutions on the subject of Bible reading, which is a resolution that lots of people make, going to do it this year. And the writer said that the American Bible study Society and research has shown that half of Americans want to read the Bible more often. Only 15% read on a daily basis. The oldest Americans and those living in the South are doing better than most. So if you're on this side of the Mason-Dixon line, you're in better shape than the Pennsylvania people. Okay, that's just saying. Just saying here. Okay, but you get the point. You know, and the writer goes on to say, forget this busyness excuse. Give it up. Give it up. You got to do what is going to serve you best and serve you well. You need to give up some things to make it the priority. You need to give up the walking dead or whatever it is that, that you need to to make it a, a major part of life. The reader says, it can feel like work to read the Bible. Some of us wonder for what reward, but it's difficult to measure the slow incremental change the Bible affects in the short term. Our spiritual growth mirrors the development of a child. The writer says, I rarely notice my own children growing. Their grandparents, however, who see them much more infrequently, are, are the first to remark on their changes. And similarly, we're too close to our own selves to appreciate the good work of a living and active word of God and what it does in our lives. But we're growing if we're reading, if we're making it a priority, even if we can't see it. And I'll finish with this to just say something to you again as kind of an older guy now. As a guy who's been a pastor for 37 years now, without stopping, it's always a mixed bag in every church and in every year and application of ministry that I've been a part of. It's a mixed bag of those who maximize the resource of Scripture in a prayer versus those who minimize it by never really quite highly enough valuing it and getting around to making it a regular part of their lives. There is one thing I can tell you that is absolutely true. In all my observations of 37 years of being with people at the best and the worst moments of their lives, of being with them in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of, of, of walking through the valley of death, in the midst of it all, I am yet to see, I am yet to give you a, an illustration of any person who in a critical moment of life did not walk through that successfully if they were a person who was a person who valued the scriptures and the relationship with God and had made that a priority of life. Similarly, I cannot remember a single instance of someone who chose other than that who did not struggle terribly and horribly in the critical moments of life because the fact of the matter is, is that they were not prepared. They had not studied. They were not ready for it. I have no shortcut for you. You can't get good enough grades on the tests of life without study and connection to class time with the divine prof. There is no other way. But the good news is this, is that this always, always, always works. And it's not complicated. It's very simple. You just need to value it and to do it. Father, help us to, in this new year, in a new time, in a new day, help us to be people who truly do value that and make it happen in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.